It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But with all the current uncertainty, how do we know when and where to put our hard-earned money to work for us? It's easy to become distracted by that shiny object or the quote-unquote next best thing. So how do we determine which strategies will best align with our financial goals? Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies to build our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Danny Nichols. And I'm Chris Thompson. This is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Listen, if you're interested in passive real estate investing, but aren't sure how or where to get started, our passive investing guide walks you through the entire process from understanding the benefits to performing the due diligence. Download your copy today at twosmartassets.com and start taking action. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Amy Tiemann. And today we are the Two Smart Assets. For those who are not yet familiar with Amy, she is an investor, developer, and is CEO of TM1 Properties. She brings 20 years of construction experience to her business, where she now focuses on commercial real estate investing. Amy, it's great to see you. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's awesome. Thanks for yeah. Excited, excited to, speak to, to you. be here. Absolutely, me too. Excited to speak with you. Uh, you know, it's been a been a long time coming, so very excited to speak with you, Amy. You know, we like to kick the show off by hearing more about you, really, our guests. So, tell us more about your background, your story, and the path you took to get to where you are today in your real estate investing career. Well, um, it, it was back in two thousand and three. Um, I, had, my husband and I, at the time, my husband at the time, we're not married anymore, but. We had started a construction company and um, I was working in tech in, in Austin and um, I wasn't really excited about that. And my family were contractors. So my grandfather had a glass company. My dad took it over in 72. I worked for him for a little while. So I knew construction. I knew that environment. Um, and so when my husband at the time started a construction company, I was working in, at Applied Materials, this large semiconductor company in Austin. And on the side, I was helping him with the, you know, the business part of it. And then I just didn't want to do it anymore. So he said, well, we'll just come on. We'll just, we'll, we'll start this thing together and we'll just kind of grow it. And we did. And so we grew it uh, to be a national commercial construction company. We were in 16 states by 2014. And along that path of, of building retail stores across the United States, we'd started real estate investing. So in uh, 2008, started flipping homes because every general contractor at some point comes house flipper. They just like all do <laughs> like at some point. And so we started doing that and then, um, and then got quickly got into single family rentals and then we got into uh, multifamily in 2010. So on all the multifamily projects though, we came in as a limited partner, but then we were also the general contractor on the job. So we came in, put in our money, and then we were also the GC doing the work, day one, takeover, demo, all that, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and then, oops, and then we, uh, I'm driving everybody, so. <laughs> um, and then um, I quickly transitioned into being a sponsor. Um, that was in uh, 2015. Along the way, our friends found out that we were renovating multifamily and all the friends who were buying apartments had us come. So. I've, I've renovated over 50, 50 to 60 multifamily properties in Central Texas. Wow. So that experience allowed me then to become a sponsor. And so 2015 became a full-time sponsor of real estate deals, uh, bought, uh, started buying deals. And I just kind of never looked back. I got divorced in 2017, but I just could continue. I just kept going. So Wait. that's kind of been my journey in, in real estate. So, well, yeah. you, got qu you got quite of a lot of experience and I love to hear that, right? And your journey kind of progresses each time. So that, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I do, have a, I do have a question. So you had a lot of experience, you know, you've learned how to build a business. You took it national, a national brand basically, right? And you built that. Yep. And then you, you had, you mix that with your real estate investing with, you know, single family and stuff uh -huh. like that. But, but then you got into the multifamily side and you said you did, um, you were basically a GC for some of these deals and then also yep. a, a, lim a limited investor, a passive investor. So when you were going into those deals, those multifamily deals, did you did you envision being a limited uh, a limited investor, a passive investor, uh, along with the um, GC, or was it kind of just like on the side there? It was, yeah. I mean, 
I think it worked out to where that was, I mean, our business was fueling our investment side. I didn't feel like I had enough knowledge to be the sponsor right away, right? Even though I'd run businesses and I've been property managing single family, multifamily is just a whole other ball of wax. So I was glad that I was a limited partner first, right? I, and I could learn from, and now I was a limited partner with different sponsors, right? So I could learn what different sponsors were doing and Because it's a whole thing that you have to learn to be a sponsor other than just, you know, finding a deal and managing a deal, right? You got to raise capital. You got to like manage investors. You got to do all these different things. And, and it's, it's a bit, it's a large skill set that you have to learn and, and, and manage through transactions and asset manage. And, you know, so I was glad I I was an LP first. I, I tell everybody to do it. I'm like, don't think you can like, oh yeah, I'm, cooler than, you know, whoever, and I can go, I can go knock down a hundred unit. Uh, no, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't care how cool you are. You're right. not going to go now to go buy a 20 unit, go buy a 10 unit, go figure it out, go property manage. You know, it's just a lot of people think, Oh yeah, no, it's no big deal. And all these people tell them, Oh, it's no big deal. You can go do it. And I'm like, BS. Hard <laughs> hell. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love to hear that. You know, I know in my personal experience being a passive investor, I've learned so much, you know, just, you know, especially if you really pay attention to what's going on. And so it sounds like for you, you know, the uh, being a passive investor really had an impact on, you know, becoming an active investor because you learn quite a bit. And so, you know, oh, yeah. with your with your experience as a passive investor, what did you pay attention to the most in terms of like the communications and financials? Were you were you diving deep into those? And if so, oh, yeah. uh, as a passive investor, but if so, are there any categories or numbers that you that you're giving more attention to than others? Well, I was watching the cost side, right? So, it, which, which a lot of people don't do this, and I don't know why. It's like the stupidest thing ever. But you, as a passive investor, are given gold mines of information every month in those financial statements, right? So, mm-hmm. when you decide to go underwrite your first deal, you should know what the water and sewer is going to cost you. You should know which repair and maintenance should cost you, right? On average per unit, because you get financials every freaking month, right? I mean, so like, why wouldn't you use the information that you're given, right? And so, um, and you learn, you learn a lot. And and you ask, and if your sponsor is any good, you know, they'll be more than welcome to answer your questions, right? And and talk you through stuff and because you're their investor. So, you know, so I learned a lot initially, um, and, and I did, I mean, the, the financials were very, very helpful. So when I started underwriting and started looking at my own deals, it was easy, right? On the, on the cost side, it was fairly easy. I can, I could just fill that in with, I know what the averages are for this market. Cause I've invested in four of them in this market. You get a lot of information that's a pass more than you think you can. And so you can really build a good pro forma just from what you've invested in. You should know how many applications are, you should expect a month, right? All that stuff. Like, it's just kind of interesting. So, yeah. I love yeah. that point. You said it's a, it's a gold mine, and it really is, right? Because you can you can really learn yeah. a lot lot from that information that you're getting every month or every quarter from those syndicators. So I think that's a great point. I do want to ask a question about kind of your your experience, um, you know, and you kind of mentioned it earlier, but you know, you you had uh, experience building a business, uh, and then you got into multifamily and you did some passive investing. You were the GC, uh, you know, when you got into that multifamily, was the end goal always to be a full time, uh, just a syndicator, sponsor your own deals, or was there ever a uh, a point in your mind where you're like, hey, I just basically want to be a service provider, you know, a GC for these deals. Oh God, no. I was like, I'm retiring from construction. I love y'all people, but it's same problem, different day. I peace out. Like I would, that's <laughs> why. I was like, I don't want to do for construction for other people anymore. Like that was it, really, honestly. Um, so it's, you know, and it, it, it because it is, it's tough. I mean, being a being a contractor is like I I feel for those people. Like the good ones are good for a reason, and they they love what they do, and they can mitigate it, you know all sorts of crazy crap. And now I'll just stay on the development side. Now I'll just go hire the contractors. <laughs> Absolutely, it's fabulous. Absolutely, it's fabulous. Yeah. And I do want to yeah. dive into that development here in a bit. But before we do that, you know, I'd like to hear, you know, as you said, you transitioned and you're doing your own deals, syndicating your own deals. I'd like to hear more about uh, that first syndication you did on your own. Can you give us an overview of that investment or the business plan, et cetera? Sure. So I was selling. Um, so my husband and I got divorced in 2017. And so we owned a 40 unit that we'd bought together. Like it was just ours. And so I was selling that 40 unit. 
And a broker that was on that deal had come across this other one down in uh, Corpus Christi. And so um, he he gave it to me. Basically, it was just like, here, you want to buy this? And I'm like, sure, I'll look at it, <laughs> right? And because he knew I was about to have a pile of cash. So, uh, and so I went down there and I looked at it and I really liked the deal. And so, um, so that first deal, uh, it was in Corpus. We bought it, you know, ugh. Right before Hurricane Harvey hit, like it was, you know, yeah, it was fun. That was, yeah, it's like, you know, you, you know, you can, like, you know, the saying is you can go, you can make, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Well, if you can make it after a hurricane hits your property, you can make it anywhere. Like you can, you can solve any problem because a hurricane hits your property, right? So, yeah, that was special. Um, so yeah, so, but that was the first deal I syndicated and, um, I raised 1.5 million. And the whole property was, uh, we bought it for a little over 37 a door. Um, it was like a piece of junk because that's what I buy. I buy ugly and make it pretty. So, um, and yeah, that was, that was my first deal I did. Um, so it was a little over 4 million or so. And it had a big construction project on it. And it was tough because the hurricane hit. And the hurricane wasn't so much the physical damage to the property. It was the economic damage to the region. I mean, you think... Right now, I think it's hard getting like lumber. Like that's what I went through when the hurricane hit. There, I, there was no siding. There was no lumber. There was no roofing materials because it was all got sucked up in the whole region. Wow. And it was just like this weirdo thing that happened. And so the delays that we went through, that we're going through now, I went through back in, in 2017 and 2018. I mean, I went through four roof. I went through four painters, two roofers. Um, and just a slew of people that would just get up and leave and they'd flake out and leave on you. And a lot of that's happening now, honestly, because there's lots of labor shortages right now. So it's, it's just, it's just kind of an interesting dynamic that we kind of went through. So that was fun. Yeah. That's an interesting story. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it sounds like you had a lot of challenges with that first deal. Right. And I think a a, a thing that's really important, especially about those challenges, even if it's the first deal, second deal, third deal is the lessons you learn from those. Right. And it sounds like maybe you've taken some lessons from that first deal and, you know, carry them to today. What are some of those lessons maybe that you could share with us? Um, to always overestimate the reserves that you need, always overestimate the reserves you need get more cash than you need. It's not going to hurt your returns. Everybody thinks, ah, oh, I can't do that because I'm going to hurt their investor returns. BS, rover raise, bring in more money. You need like stash money. You need it because you're going to, especially if you're doing a value add deal, um, you need extra cash sitting there. And so I always over raise. Um, and uh, other things that, you know, just, just um, marketing is going to take longer than you think it will like a lot longer rebranding and remarketing your property. Honestly, truly, it might even take you a year. It depends on how bad the property was when you bought it. Like I buy ugly, like I buy really ugly, right? And so everybody, there's a stigma to those properties and you have to realize what you have to do to rebrand them, to make them new, to make them okay, feel safe, people want to go there. It's it's an all out like blitz, effort to do that. And it's not easy. And if you haven't done a value add project, uh, you know, don't start with a big one because you'll just kill yourself. And it, and, you know, your investors are going to hate your guts. And like, it, it, there's a skill to doing value add, re, you know, repositions. I mean, it's not for everybody and it's not for the faint of heart. That's for damn sure. So, so you had the understanding that is like one of the big key things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So why focus on the the really ugly properties, like you said? I mean, is it because of your your GC background, you have that experience, or what? What's what's the damn that? things? Just they find me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> like they just sell me like I'm like a value add magnet. I don't I know. I, no, I think it's because a lot of people shy away from them, and I'm not scared of them, right? And there's a lot of money to be made in them, right? If you if you have this skill to where you can come in and reposition a property and take a C property and turn it into a B, right? Well, there's a lot of money made that can be made in that, but it's not easy. It's harder. And, but I've just, I've done it so many times now that I just, it's not, it's not hard for me anymore. Right. But it initially was, it sucked. It's horrible. Right. Um, but you, you know, once you learn the skills and the, and what you kind of need to do and how you kind of, you know, mitigate through some of that kind of stuff that, you know, it's not a big deal. So, are you yeah. are you still finding those type of deals in today's market? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got so I got the 
uh, another Corpus deal. I just closed on that one for 52 a door. And then my Houston deal is at 74 a door, right? And so I'm getting, all, I don't, I don't go into a deal unless the investors are going to make 10% or more cash on cash or 20% more IRR, right? That's not, if it doesn't, if it doesn't compute to that conservatively, it's not a deal to me, right? So yeah, I'm finding them. Um, you know, and you know, with the impending chaos, we don't know what's going to happen in the next six sure. months. Like we, nobody does. My crystal ball broke long before I was born. <laughs> so, um, but you know, when the banks start hiring foreclosure specialists, you know, something's happening, right? I mean, and then they are, right? They're hiring those folks. They, they see, they've got big balance sheets. They know what, who's not paying, right? So if you've got some of that and, and you see that, that that's out there, then you know that, that there's going to be some deals to be had. Now, I would assume they get all absorbed very quickly. I, I think there's enough demand out there. And there's such, especially in Texas, there's such a, a shortage of housing. But in a lot of really good markets, there's a shortage of housing. Like it's not, this is not a phenomenon that's just happening in Austin, Texas, right? I mean, it's all over. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's going to get absorbed really fast. And, and then we'll see like in two years where it sits, right? If they still have stuff on their balance sheets, they got to get rid of it. That's when it gets fun, right? So 2008 happened, but we started picking up really cool stuff in 2010, right? In mm. 2011. That's when we got the real deals, right? After they sifted through all the easy stuff they could sell, then the hard stuff came out, right? And then, then you know, that's the stuff I like. I like the hard stuff, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. It's Absolutely. Cheap. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I appreciate you sharing all that. I think that's, that's fantastic. I love to hear that. I do want to circle back to something you kind of mentioned before with when we were talking about your first deal, you know, you had the, you had the, um, the general contractor experience and you had been a passive investor before, but on the first deal, you said you went and raised out, you know, a, a good amount of money and stuff like that. And, you know, um, you know, in terms of syndication, there are there are a number of critical roles uh, that can be accounted for, such as raising capital, interacting with investors, property management, etc. Right? You know, as you yeah. moved into doing your own deals, you had the contractor experience, but did you already have raising capital experience or any of those other um, roles in place, or how how were you able to do that, and what actions did you take to gain those skills or fill those roles? Um, well, I've been a property manager for, so I did have that. I did have that. Um, sure. And the capital raising, no, man, I was winging it. I was figuring it out on my own. And I was like, you know, I had no clue. And investor relations, shit, no, didn't know damn thing. Like I was <laughs> like totally, like I, I mimicked what my other sponsors had done. And so I was just kind of going off of those guidelines, right? But no, I was, I was figuring out as I went. I mean, I'm, on, I'm an entrepreneur. So that's kind of what you do. That's, you just, you go with what you know, and then you figure out the rest. And um, so- and it was a it was a big learning curve, right? I mean, it was there was a there was a lot of stuff. Obviously, um, my, my first deal, I didn't communicate enough, and I should have communicated a lot more, right? And it's a big lesson I learned was like just over communicate. Like if things are going bad, who cares? Just tell them, right? Tell them what's going on. Tell them how you're trying to mitigate it. I mean, a freaking hurricane hit the property. Like things right. are just going to be rosy, whatever. Like you know, <laughs> they're not stupid. Um, so, you know, but I, I didn't, and, and, and I was, I did a lot of different things. I mean, I, I switched property management software and that, oh my Lord, that is so much fun. So on my first deal, I was the GC. I was a property manager. I was an invest, investor relations manager. I was the accountant, right? Wow. Don't do that either. That's stupid. <laughs> like, so, um, and I was killing myself. I was killing myself trying to do everything I could because I was trying to save money because, you know, the economic impacts of what was going on, I was like hunkering down trying to make this investment work, right? So now I have an investor relations manager. Now I have an accounting person. Now I have, and you need those people in place. You don't realize when you go become a sponsor, the amount of people you need for it to, it to go well. The investors want their financials. They don't care if you're sick. The investors want their financials or the reports. They don't care if you, you know, you're, you know, whatever. You need to have like redundancies in your team so that you can get that stuff out to them no matter what. It can't be just you. That's that's not realistic. That's not sustainable. You can't do that stuff, right? And and you get into larger and larger deals, the investors demand it. The institutions demand it. The family offices demand it. They just demand it, right? And so you just, you know, you, uh, and it is a good business model to have, have people on your team. So sure. the same. 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I love to hear that too. Cause you know, building a team is probably, you know, very, as you said, it's very critical in, in this business, you know, and I know there are a lot of investors who are out there right now looking to build a team to, you know, get into the, the active side, you know, in your experience, how were you, how have you gone about in the past or when you were building your teams, how were you able to build those teams? Where were you finding partners? How are you connecting with them and building those relationships? You know, uh, as you go along, you learn, um, either because you're lazy or you're savvy, one of the two, is you remember people, right? You like get really good at remembering people you're networking with because it, it might not be that, that you know, the person I meet today, but you might know somebody that I, like you might not be able to help me, but you probably know somebody who might be able to help me, right? So you get really, really good at keeping up with your networks and your connections and, you know, just... And it, and it becomes second nature to you after a while that you kind of do that stuff, right? And then you obviously build your CRM systems and you do all that different stuff. And you, but, but you just like your networking is gold. And so, and I have always like, when I would, so, and part of this is just from my experience from being a general contractor and having to go into like, I would go into, I don't know, like say Jefferson City, Missouri. Right. I have to go build a store. I know zero people in Jefferson City, Missouri. Right. And so I'm having to go find painters and and plumbers and HVAC people. And and we got really good at being the GC that could get stores open when nobody else could get them open. So they would give us a store and we had got it open in seven days. Right. That BS. Right. And so but we charge them like five times what we normally charge them for that reason. But they're publicly traded. And when they said they're going to have so many stores open a quarter, they by golly better have so many stores open a quarter, right? So because of that, I got really good at networking with people, learning how to find, being very resourceful and how to find people. So on my, on my, when I was, when I was like looking for a plumber, why well, I'd ask the electrician, Hey, who do you know? Like, who's the, who's a good plumber in town? They all know each other. They're all like buddies sure. hang out the same damn bar, right? <laughs> so you just do that stuff. And so when you're in this business now, I network lots of, I network with a lot of investors. I network my, my insurance guy probably will hook me up with a lender, right? My, Mm. my property manager, your property manager, my companies might know who's going to sell, right? I mean, it's just people are in this business. It's a very, very small world, very small world. And everybody knows everybody. And, or if they don't, they know somebody who knows somebody, right? And it's just, it's just how, that's how this really. And so if you um, build good relationships, and you keep your name up and your reputation up, you're going to do just fine, right? You don't want to have a bad reputation in this business because it'll kill you. It's the only thing you got. It's the only thing you take with you is that what you how, how what kind of person you are, right? So that's how I that's how I did. So when I would build my teams, I would ask people. I would, you know, um, obviously do all the normal things where you're looking for people. Um, but I've just um, I was in HR for a long time. So I've been able to like interview really well. I get a fairly good sense of who fits in my culture and the team I want to have because I've been doing it for a long time. So that's also helpful. Um, So that's kind of how I find people. Um, And it's, and you know, and it's, it's that it's just talking to a bunch of different people um, and getting referrals. I mean, it's really, everybody thinks, well, that just sounds so easy. I go, that's not easy either. It's a long time, (laughs) but you know, you just got to, know that it's important to you and make right. it a priority, right? Yep. That's what you got to do. So, you're, absolutely, yeah. you're absolutely right. And I appreciate you sharing that. I know it's one of those things that can be difficult for some people, you know, follow up and maintaining relationships. But like you said, if you make it a priority, it will be just that a priority, right? So I think that's uh, yeah. that, that's very critical. Amy, you know, it's been a great yeah. conversation. I know before we get out here, though, tell us about TM1 Properties, your focus and any current projects you're working on. So um, for this year, uh, we're looking at multifamily mixed use projects, uh, some office buildings. If I do office, it'll be in Austin and my home base um, and uh, all over the state of Texas. So I buy all over the state. So I'm bu- I just bought in Amarillo. I bought in Houston. I just bought in Corpus. I'm buying another one in Houston. I'm looking at Austin and Dallas, like all over the freaking place, right? If it's in Texas and I like the, mar- you know, the submarket, I'll buy it, right? I mean, it's fine. Um, so the latest project we have is in Houston is a 227 unit multifamily portfolio. It's a really great deal. I like it because of the basis is cheap. That's a big thing too. You know, we do know there's an impending chaos. We don't know what's happening. Um, but the way I mitigate a lot of that risk is I buy cheap, 
And if you buy cheap and you got a lot of wiggle room and, you know, things can come down and you're not going to, you know, not sleep at night, right? Because you're going to have enough room to kind of, you know, mitigate some of that kind of stuff. So that's, as a sponsor, that's your big, that's one of your big jobs. Your job is to mitigate risk for your investors and your job is to make them money. So you got to do both. So that's kind of how I'm mitigating risk right now is being really careful on my sub markets and, and then just buying cheap. So that's kind of my plan. So yeah. Cool. Cool. Love to hear yep. that. Uh, one more thing, Amy, before we hop off, what's the best way for our listeners to find out more about you and how they can connect? My website is the best way. So if you go to TM, the number one properties.com, properties, plural, TM1 properties.com, they can um, book a call with me there. They can register to invest. They can do all sorts of stuff there. Um, and that's the best way to kind of learn more about me and kind of what I do. Um, I'm on Instagram, same thing, TM1 properties. I'm on Clubhouse a lot, so they can find me there too. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So um, every once in a while, I am starting to do some LinkedIn lives. So um, just around, you know, when I ever get my fans to see about whatever I want to talk about. So, you know, i pop that room. So, Love yeah. it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, Amy. We're going to make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes so our listeners can find out more about you and connect when they're ready. Amy, really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today. It's been great. Sure. Sounds great. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.